Good morning and welcome to Little by Little, a short time in God's Word. Turn with me again to Matthew chapter 18. At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with only one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always are at the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of that one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Quick note before we continue uh, verses 15 through 19. Jesus talks about hell there. It's actually something he talked quite a bit about. It's not an imaginary place. It's a, it's a real place. As real as heaven is, uh, hell is also a real place. And the warnings that Jesus brings about it are serious. And yeah. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. How to deal with sin within the body of Christ. Specifically, uh, sin that is against a brother or a sister. Uh, this is an interesting passage and continue to watch as tomorrow we continue on in this chapter as Jesus talks about forgiveness uh, and really goes with this passage. Um, so when someone sins against you, a fellow believer, what do you do? You're supposed to go to them and try to work it out. Now this doesn't happen well. Why? Well, because most of us don't like confrontation. Even with those that we are close with, we don't want to bring stuff up. And yet, when it's a sin issue, that's exactly what we're supposed to do, right? I've had people that disagree with me, uh, and so rather than coming to me and working it out, you know, you get things just lurking in the background. Um, and especially if it's like a sin issue, then I would hope that they would uh, let me know, right? Because if I'm doing something that's causing uh, that they believe that I'm sinning, I, I want to know. And that's true... Uh, just in general, right? Try to work things out quickly. Sometimes it's not a sin issue, it's just a disagreement, you know, it's an argument, uh, but these are good ways to handle those things, whether it's a sin or just a simple uh, misunderstanding or a disagreement. Otherwise, you end up with this tension that everyone's walking around with, unresolved things, lack of depth in the body of Christ, and it's not good. So the second step then is if that first confrontation, the first time you get together, doesn't go well, you bring two or three others with you, and hopefully that will be the thing that turns the tide. But if not, then you bring it to the church, and then, again, if that doesn't go well, they're to be considered as not part of the church anymore. Now, those are all big steps, especially that last one, and you don't take those things lightly, and most times, we don't bring things up before the church like that. Mostly because most people don't do the first two steps. And so we never get to the third step. Imagine if we all started doing those things more often. I think we'd still 
have disagreements, we still have problems, but when we actually sin against one another, we could work things out, which would help us when we don't have sin and it's just a problem with other people. Many times just to sit down is going to solve most problems. And when it comes to sin, uh, those are the times where we need to uh, definitely follow God's Word and definitely try to bring up a point of reconciliation, a point of um, bringing things into the light and just going through the process that's outlined for us here so that we can see restoration happen. And so the more public sin, uh, the more public process.